right now, I can give you a dem quick demonstration of digital rebar just to give you a flavor of things. Um, like I said, we have a UX. Uh, typically, you drop into our info and profs screen. Uh, we can, we, it's very straightforward UX. I think most people that have looked at it have been able to um, pretty quickly assimilate just interacting with the UX. Um, but essentially, um, some of the things that we have, um, basically you have our content library, which is our catalog of things you can pull down from the rack end portal that we provide as value add. Some of it's open source and free. Uh, for example, our community content, our crib, which is our Kubernetes re rebar immutable bootstrap. <laughs> crib, Kubernetes thing, um, which I'll show you in a minute, maybe, and some other things. But th th that allows you to pull down content. Uh, customers can actually implement their own content library. So if a customer is a, a bit more uh, advanced, they might actually have their own suite of content that they've developed. I should uh, mention content is not scary at all. Aside from the fact that it's JSON, blah, not very fun to interact with from a human perspective, excellent for machine ingestion. But we also can remarshal JSON to YAML, so we can ingest YAML or JSON. Either way, we don't care. Whatever you're best uh, uh, comfortable with uh, authoring, editing, or looking at uh, content, you can look at it in JSON or YAML. So everything from configuration to content is expressed as JSON or YAML. Internally, it's serialized JSON and, and then remarshaled into Go. Um, I forget the, the structures Go uses. Um, uh, so we have things like uh, boot ISOs, which might be if you're doing a traditional installation pattern, provisioning pattern, where you have a, a CentOS or an Ubuntu ISO image, we can load the ISO image. We actually tear the ISO apart, pull out the uh, initRD, the kernel, the, um, all of the components and pieces to actually pixie boot that uh, uh, ISO image and that OS distribution. We automatically do all of that and then make it available as part of the content as what we call boot environments or the, the operating system environment you'd like your machine to boot in is how I try and remember or teach people what a boot env is because they go, huh, a boot env? I don't get that. Um, we have plugins. I don't have a whole lot here exposed right now. The only one I'm using is Packet IPMI. So we have a driver that drives Packet's uh, bare metal infrastructure so we can interact with their metadata services, pull SSH keys, power cycle machines, do other interesting things within Packet's bare metal environment. And so we can actually drive Packet's infrastructure from our own DRP endpoint through this plugin. Um, uh, DRP CLI itself is the actual uh, this is what gets pulled down from the endpoint when a machine's being provisioned, which becomes our agent, which I talked about briefly. It's also the full-blown CLI for doing things. Uh, we have a job subsystem, and actually we just went through a complete rewrite on the jobs and logs subsystem, and so we've greatly expanded it so we can do it, and I don't have the uh, current version of the endpoint to show it on here, but we can actually trace a single action entire through its uh, inception to, to finish throughout the system. So you can actually flag a given action and trace that at any given debug, error, warn, whatever level you want through the system without having to turn on global uh, logging uh, values. So we can actually do this very granular control. It's really cool. Um, and then, um, so I have the UI here, so it's gonna complain to me because uh, we use feature flags and the feature flag on the endpoint says I don't support this additional endpoint log capability that does some really cool log filtering stuff and tracing of uh, provisioning processes. Uh, content at its very basic actually starts with parameters. A parameter is just like a variable. Everybody's familiar with a variable, I think. Uh, one of the differences uh, for us, parameters are, are, can be type enforced. So we can actually do type enforcement of the parameter. So when you instantiate a, a parameter and use it, we'll actually validate that what you're doing with it is actually appropriate for the model for the parameter. You don't have to do that. If you want to instantiate parameters on the fly and just do whatever the heck you want with them, you can do that. We don't suggest doing that. Um, we have profiles. A profile is a group of parameters. Uh, in this case, we have a couple of parameters, chain stage map, crib cluster admin, crib cluster, crib cluster join, et cetera, et cetera. SSH access, SSH access holds a demo user uh, SSH key. All of this is a profile which um, is actually JSON. One of the changes I have not gotten into the UI yet is to do raw JSON output because I hate looking at this. I'd rather look at JSON than this, um, which I guess that makes me messed up, I think, somehow. A lot of people like this because you can sort of expand and look at 
you know, the contents of what these things are. Ultimately, this is all just JSON uh, that's prettified, supposedly. Um, we, and then, uh, so profiles allow you to group a set of parameters, which could be anything. It, it expresses a configuration set of, of metadata and information that you would ultimately apply to a machine that is provisioned. That metadata information is used within the provisioning lifecycle and workflow. And one of the things that we do is all of our content is 100% Golang templated and instantiated dynamically on the fly at request. So when a something requests a piece of content, it's instantiated and then uh, filled out based on the Golang template on the fly and then served to the endpoint for use uh, dynamically. It's a really cool, powerful capability that allows us to also create um, templates and sub-templates and do branching conditional uh, statements to branch on templates and do different things based on environment and variables, the machine itself, whatever you can really imagine with it. And it allows us extremely complex capabilities to write a lot of modular, reusable components that are very flexible once you understand your provisioning roles and capabilities. Yes, you had a question. How do you assign, let's say, a profile to a certain set of machines? Like, like you can Good question. Yeah, so if you want to do a thousand machines, you're not going to do a third of UX. Yeah. Uh, but if you're going to do a handful of machines, you can come to the machines here and you can say, give me a profile of uh, packet co uh, console and apply this to the machine. Now, in a large set of infrastructure, DRP CLI or an API set of calls will do that. So on, conversely, uh, I still have an endpoint here. So then I have DRP CLI as a binary. And our uh, CLI binary is built in help, so you never have to do minus minus help or dash help, just a bare word, and then it'll show you what's next if you haven't completed it. Uh, so example, DRP CLI boot ems modifies boot environments, which is the operating system configurations, or in this case, DRP CLI profiles. So we can do DRP CLI profiles. We also have bash auto completion built into the binary, and, um, but you have to install the auto completion uh, uh, files. We regurgitate it and allow you to install it automatically from every CLI binary. I haven't installed it here because these are just cattle. I don't care about them. But DRP CLI profile. So in this case, I can do DRP CLI profiles and see it says, hey, dummy, it's profiles. And from there, I can add a profile. I can create profiles, destroy a profile. I can determine if a profile exists, <coughs> return true or false. Um, I can get parameters from inside the profile. If I know the parameter name, I can get the value of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there's a lot of options that we can do. We can also set um, profile parameters. We can update profiles. We can actually do, uh, one of the things that we do is we do JSON patch. And a lot of people don't understand JSON patch. It's really cool but it can really break your brain if you're trying to figure out how to do patching if you don't understand it because it doesn't work the same way everything else in the world does. Um, so, and, and as you see, we can sort of iterate down this, this path of the CLI, but this will also directly correlate to the API. So in this case, thank you. So the API would actually be endpoint colon port slash API slash v3. That's our, our endpoint base. And then it would be slash profiles, slash add, slash profiles, slash create, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, if you're manipulating content as in a JSON blob, you pass it in slightly differently. Uh, passing in a JSON blob uh, within the API call depends on whatever to, uh, library or tool you're using, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, um, I was thinking about, is there any way to like auto bucket the machine? It's a very good question. That's a question regarding classification. Yes. Out of the box, there are no classification, classification capabilities, but you can write a stage. So one of the things that we do is uh, an example where classification could work is we do DRP CLI machines list JQ, and I bet I don't have JQ installed. Uh, yes. They don't allow port 8092 out here. So, so these are the, the six machines that are by name uh, that exist in my machine. 
but I could also just as easily, easily uh, So uh, I can do that, and it's pretty pretty. So you see there's a whole lot of crap here that goes on and on and on and on. This is what we call our GoHigh inventory package. So we have a, a tool called GoHigh, which is based off of a, a Chef-based tool called OHigh, which we rewrote in Go. So I don't know if you can draw the correlation between OHigh and GoHigh, but there you go. So we came up with GoHigh. GoHigh allows us to do uh, inventory uh, uh, scraping of a machine. So some of the things that we do is we pull everything, lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of stuff off of the machine, the and we shove it into a parameter called Go High Inventory. So Go, Go High Inventory gives us BIOS version and all of this other stuff about the hardware. So this is a very standard uh, stage that a lot of people use uh, as part of the discover stage is GoHive runs, iterates this information, feeds it back through the DRP CLI, back to the DRP endpoint, and this could be fed back into an asset management system, or as part of the stage workflow, you could look up this parameter of information and go, I need to know if this machine has 12 disks. If it has 12 disks, then I know it's gonna be, if it's 12 disks of SSD type, I know it's gonna be a fast Ceph machine. Or if it has 24 slow disks, big fat spinning disks, then I know it's gonna be a Ceph slow machine and it's gonna go in my stuff slow pools, whatever. So you can do some classification there. We don't have a lot of uh, very advanced classification capabilities, but if you understand what you wanna do with, with classification, you can very easily write your own stage content based off of either OHI or GoHI inventory stuff or whatever makes sense to you. Now some things aren't very easily expressed uh, that might be a classification that might need to come from an external node classifier of some sort in that case, you're gonna to have to do an integration with us uh, of some sort to say, I wanna reach out to the ENC and figure out what my role in life is supposed to be. Based on these metrics, I'm gonna pass these metrics back to my ENC. My ENC can classify me and tell me what my role is. And then I can actually fork in the path and decide what set of stages to go down to to make this machine something unique based on that. Does that make sense? Yeah, so the, the classification stuff is all written in scripts or there is no classification stuff, oh, but well, the the, staging, the, the, the so all of the, the output information will be in JSON or YAML by default, dash dash format equals YAML, so we can get all of this in YAML if we wanted to. Uh, but all of that classification information you can look up uh, either through API calls to the DRP CLI, uh, through, with DRP CLI or the API to the endpoint, or you can pull out of the machine's object information on the machine as part of its provisioning lifecycle. Does that help answer the question? Yeah, we can make a token. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. One quick question. Uh, so if you want to push a new uh, package uh, in a whole bunch of machines, can you go to all the other space like Puppet? And yeah, so very good question. Very good question. It depends on your operational model. So if you're doing a traditional model environment where you have machines that you patch, you love, you update, you fix, you care for and feed. I don't care if you call them web-01 and you think they're cattle, but if you manage that model through doing package updates, those are pets as far as we're concerned. So that sort of update provisioning cycle is completely outside the scope of what we do, so you would use external tooling of some sort. Configuration management might be a, a very good example. I think you were just touching on there where you might use Ansible, Salt Stack, Chef, Puppet, Bosch, shell scripts, whatever, whatever, some vendor tool. Um, we're not gonna do much with it, that for you. You could do some inter integrations with us, so you can actually do part of a stage in the provisioning uh, workflow. You could bring a machine up to a given state or refresh all the packages to the most current version of packages if you're doing installs that way. Our basic um, model that we demo is doing actually package-based installs based off the public mirrors for CentOS or Ubuntu or the primary distros we sort of demo a lot. So you get that model 
by doing package-based installs of an OS, you get the latest set of packages, which causes me no grief of end because somebody always screws a package up. Kubernetes just blew up the uh, 191 packages and forgot to sign their packages. And I was demoing the crib infrastructure, uh, immutable crib Kubernetes stuff, and everything blew up because they forgot to sign their packages and I was pulling the latest packages they released. Um, so that's some of the problems related to that. If you're a shop that's looking to do immutable infrastructure, we support that model. Um, in two ways, by defining how it's configured and what gets configured in a given fashion is sort of an immutable pattern, but ultimately what you end up pulling in may not be, Exa example being that package-based install process. The next step is image-based deployments, which are starting to become relatively popular in a lot of shops because of the problem of drift. When you have large fleets of machines, you have 10,000 machines, and you have 200 of them with slightly different versions of a library on it, and you don't know what's going wrong, and you're getting really weird interactions in your application stack, and it takes you three weeks to trace down why you're getting some really weird results on um, some random percentage of hits on your application. So a lot of shops are starting to deploy immutable practices to roll out a golden image. And we support that golden image sort of rollout capability as a raw image, as a file system based image, there's a number of ways we can do it. That is advanced Rackin secret stuff. Um, we're happy to talk about within a Rackin so engagement. Go back to 2003 again. Yeah, no, ironically that's funny because 1999 actually, I started using a tool called System Im Imager and System Imager was exactly that. It was a, it was a TARF uh, file system ball of a gold image that it deployed and managed the, the hardware configuration. It was really cool, I loved it because I could just CD into my gold image and make changes and then push, push, uh, uh, you know, configuration when the whole world went away from that. And we're all sort of going back to that again. Uh, Joseph, I will not try and pronounce Joseph's last name. I'm coming in the last 20 inches of the video. What is the bare metal, what of the bare metal is actually a swarm of IOTs in particular lab on a chip systems distributed over 20, 30 mile area, rack in or digital rebar work there. Uh, uh, Joseph, I don't know if you can hear me. If you can hear me, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, um, but uh, IoT, I, talk to me. Shane at, <laughs> at rackend.com. Uh, pretty easy to find. I would love to talk to you, see if you have more questions. We can figure out where that fits for your use pattern, uh, if you're hearing me. Um, it does sound like a relatively more complex use pattern on flat first blush, but you never know. I like to make everything complex so I can have you write me a check. So typically in an immutable pattern, you're going to reboot the machine and boot the machine into a new image that you deploy on the machine. So there is indeed a disruption to the workflow. So now we're starting to get into philosophical differences in how you manage your application base and your content or your application state that exists on that machine. And there are a lot of very complex uh, uh, ways of doing that. But ultimately the pattern is definitely uh, suggesting the reboot, deploy a new image on the machine, and then bring the machine back up. Generally, this is going to be in large-scale clusters where you might have a web farm of, you know, 20 web servers or something, or a thousand web servers. You'll take the web server out of rotation in your SLB, you reboot the web server, reload it, reload the content on it, and then bring it back into the SLB. These are sort of large-scale infrastructure patterns. Small scale shops, small to medium sized shops, they typically don't exist in this world. And that's um, a pattern where we would just suggest you use an external tool of some sort to manage the update uh, package, uh, security releases, et cetera, life cycle of your machines post provisioning. We very much support a traditional deploy a single provisioning server and love it and care for it and provision your machines on it. You love and care for your machines, even if they are somewhat a, a a generic set of farm machines for you. Um, that pattern is still very well supported by us for a single monolithic um, central, I call it centralized versus distributed provisioning activities. And a centralized provisioning activity is, is well supported in that model. But tooling to manage your, your infrastructure after the fact is up to you, what you want to use. And we make that distinction because day two operations, everybody does it differently. Everybody has a different set of tools. 
We don't want to enforce tool sets on you. There was a question in the very back, yes. Yeah, so I had a, a comment, um, which you just mentioned the term, distributed provisioning. Um, Edge, IoT, fog, environments. So, yeah, for, for those things, but, but even in a data center. Data ce large data centers, top of rack is a distributed provisioning activity, yes. Exactly. Instead of using the ATP Alberta to bring all those broadcast messages back to some central node that yep. is your DHCP server, you're talking about um, temporarily spinning up uh, provisioning servers yep. across exactly. all the racks and everything, yep. which is kind of a cool idea. It is, um, it is. Okay. For us, temporary provisioning servers wouldn't would be useless to us, but I can totally see having them. Yep. You know, one one per rack, living on potentially a switch. Uh, eventually. In in large infrastructures, the file system store that I talked about previously, everything is stored in key value uh, context uh, within JSON format, and we actually support plug. It's not a plugin, and I'm not supposed to say plugin, but it's like a plugin that allows us to support external key, key value services. Modular. Modular, yes. It allows us to support external key value services and the example integration we have is uh, HashiCore's console, uh, but other key value uh, services can be supported. If you wanted a distributed data store on the back end to support your provisioning services, we can do that. That's definitely a more enterprise feature uh, than the traditional lay it down on a file system, let a file system manage it. Um, but um, yes, you had a follow on to that? Um, not to that, actually. I had a question, which is, so, so at LinkedIn, we have written something that is not similar to uh, this particular tool. Okay. Um, it is more centralized. It is semi-distributed. Okay. Uh, and then we have a provisioning server per, I can't remember if it's gone to per core now. It used to be per site, um, per, per data center. Yep. We, we have a yep. we have a solution for that it's yeah we actually have a, we have a baked in solution for that um, it, it's not very elegant but we have a table of things we've run into that don't <laughs> behave the way we expect them to and we run through that process every single time we do IPMI and we go oh yes this and seriously this is this is where you you notice the difference between tier one vendor and everybody else yeah. like the difference between supermicro and like say hp yeah very much so usually yeah. more consistent yeah, yeah. Uh, ironically those supermicros kind of flipped everybody on its head by supporting redfish so much earlier than everybody else has redfish is a, a re-implementation or a new implementation of what ipmi protocol does which manages uh baseboard management controllers bmc is the actual hardware component that implements the ipmi protocol to do things like set next boot power cycle power on power off provides some information back. As to but exactly <laughs> it, it, yes and i have no idea if the vendors have been able to per um, um, play around with it as much as they did with ipmi and, and not follow the standards which is what causes so much grief with ipmi the implementations vary quite a bit as well yes but in the end it basically comes down to if you have a large number of different machines, you're going to have to figure out what the differences are. Unfortunately, there is no shortcut in that path. Different strategies, yep. slightly That's different strategies. You, uh, put the AI sticker on there and get a little <laughs> more. And yes, we have addressed that problem. It is not a pretty solution. Uh, we wish we have come up with a much more elegant solution, but at the end of the day, we have not been able to figure out some any better solution than a lookup table of oddities and rare edge cases that we run into. But in general, which IPMI uh, commands do you need? You basically need reboot and assign boot Generally, disk yes. Next boot, boot Pixie, next boot Pixie. disk, uh, power on, power off, power yeah, so re and recycle. Those are, yeah. Uh, how does it deal with, let's say, a storage system with you know, a thousand ever out users? And so then you Um, how do you, because a lot of times, um, especially for storage 
So typically, what you're talking about is starting to get into the realm of customization. So there's, do you know what a dosi do is? Two step dance, dosi do. Okay, it's an American dosi do, two step dance. So IPMI uh, configuration and management is a dosi do problem. It's a two step problem because it's chicken and egg. It's a catch twenty two. So when you have a machine that comes from a vendor, uh, naked, not configured, nothing on it. You either specify to the vendor when the machine shipped something that gets you started, or don't specify anything and say just DHCP and let me control it from there. Or I'm going to sit down on a console, I'm going to go through the vendor's utility, I'm going to configure some bare uh, configuration pieces of information, user pass, you know, whether I have a static IP assignment for the IPMI, et cetera, and then you go into your automation lifecycle. So that whole stage and process is very specific to any given shop and how their hardware is shipped and what their hardware supports. And we have a number of different ways that we deal with that. If your IPMI configuration is already configured, we can take over brownfield environments through our discovery process where we can use basic IPMI utilities to discover the IPMI information on the machine and inject that into the DRP endpoint and then manage and control the machine from there. If there's nothing on it, if we can at least pixie boot the machine by default, we can write a stage that then says, now write all of the configuration for the IPMI through the uh, sledgehammer image to manage the BMC configuration and do what we want with it, which might be set DHCP, might be set username, set password, set the policies on it, all of these pieces and parts but you're talking about customization there. It's very specific to your given machine and hardware and the tools that we either have or don't yet have in our sledgehammer image that we have to put in there to support a given hardware configuration. It, there's just a number of ways to do it and it depends on how you want to do it. We can actually pre-fill um, uh, machine objects and pre-fill out information about a machine. Some of that information might be IPMI information that when the machine comes up that we do something to it. Some of this might be um, you know, interact with an external service to do the vendor tooling to configure the BMC with the vendor's tools, iDRAC, uh, Rack Atom, or ILO, or whatever those tools happen to be, if you prefer that tool set in-house. We can run some of those tools uh, as part of the stage process itself and do some of that enforcement. That is absolutely an advanced pattern that we don't support by default, that it's a pattern that we've um, proven out with other customers, and it's every single customer environment's unique, how they want it done, what they want done, and how, what pieces they want managed. One of the things I've done in the past is basically get a large shipment of services just to be sure you configure some USB sticks. You know it's going to boot off of the USB stick at least. Yeah. Put them in, put them off that, and have the BIOS configuration utilities in there to at least configure yeah. the IPMI so and so on correctly. Switch on DHCP, maybe inject your credentials, whatever, yeah. and just make sure that at least that's to some of, some of these sort of workflows you're talking about, we're starting to get more to enterprise or large-scale infrastructure problems. Correct. And so one of, one of the things that we've, we've worked with is some of the other asset management databases with many varying models where assets may actually exist uh, at pre-order and they manage all of their assets in an asset management database before it's ordered, once it's been ordered, once it's landed, once it's been configured, once it's been deconfigured, decommissioned or recommissioned and we can hook into those APIs and do things based on that or they can inject uh, machine objects into us so someday a machine comes online with a MAC address and we go, oh, hey, I know what this is. Um, you know, and some of those things, some of that is also goes back to the remediation because you've just deployed a thousand machines and 927 of them came up and are good and then, 
what's missing and now you can pull a report of what's missing and hopefully you know where you put them and what racks and which rows and what use slots, but yes. You don't know anything don't about know it. Anything. So, so, and that's what where, do do with that? yeah. Because so, we, we companies, security yep. departments have certain rules about that sort of stuff. Yeah, and, and that's very so easy. You automatically provision something yep. that, that somebody plugged into some switch somewhere. Yes, right? and we can do, yeah. if it comes up and it hits our provisioning service, we don't know about it. You can set um, default policies on uh, stages and boot ends that a machine will go into. So, there's sort of a default workflow. And it, it, a default workflow for most shops is typically get a machine to a ready state infrastructure, but it could very easily be do a security check and make sure that this machine isn't rogue or has come up where it's not supposed to or, you know, whatever. You could do that sort of, that, that is a task that you would write that does something custom to your environment that would be a stage that sits in your default workflow for unknown uh, boot environments or unknown stages on machines coming up. Uh, and so stages, I think I pointed them out earlier uh, in our workflow. So a workflow, um, there are, there's one workflow here. There's not a whole lot here. Uh, actually, there's two. Um, so this is a, a very basic, um, actually a holding pattern, a ready state infrastructure workflow where the machine comes up, we do a discovery, we do a go high inventory. We do a special stage called packet discover, which in, determines if we're in the packet environment, we call out to the packet metadata server if we get a response to it then we actually plumb API uh, and project credentials in, and then we actually can interact with their infrastructure, and then we put them into sledgehammer wait, and then the machine just sits there and waits. So this is actually on the global profile. The global profile applies to everything, so in this case, every single machine would go into sledgehammer wait, which would sit at a CentOS 7 uh, boot prompt like this, um, right here and then is in now actually in a sledgehammer wait state waiting for something else to happen. The next thing that you might do is my KAS, my Kubernetes cluster workflow. In this case, I would then select a set of machines and say, take these five, six machines, whatever, uh, and start the workflow with SSH access. So I want to inject specific SSH keys to the machine. In this case, this is a, a live boot workflow. So we're actually taking the, the sledgehammer image and we're just using it as the base operating system. We're gonna run Kubernetes in, in a live boot distro, similar to sort of the core OS pattern uh, for being able to do uh, Kubernetes. We can do that with any Linux distro that supports live boot mode. Uh, we mount local disks so we can actually have ephemeral storage uh, for uh, local disks. Or uh, we do a Docker install, then we do a crib install, which is the Kubernetes uh, configuration with kubeatom. Uh, we use kubeatom to create a join token. We write that join token back to us as in a profile. Uh, we have a race to master, so uh, machines all come up and they try and become master. Whoever becomes master first, uh, the rest of the cluster is locked, the master is configured, then the re rest of the cluster is released. And this is where I'm getting away from that single machine flow specific stuff. We do have cluster support capability for this kind of workflow. Um, but then all of the other cluster members get their uh, kubectl join. Uh, token through kubeatom to be able to dynamically join the cluster. Five machines come up, they join the cluster, boom, there's your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, one button push basically once you set up the workflow. Yes? Do you have mounts network disks or object storage? Yes, you can write that task yourself. We do not have one that does that by default because that's gonna be very specific to what you do. You could very easily, so here's a, a very good example actually. So Rob has a very good question. He wants, he wants to take mount local disks and actually mount remote disks, right? So basically what we would do is say, okay, so mount local disks is a stage, because we've defined that we're in a workflow, so a stage. So let's go take a look at stages, and we have stages here, and I wanna find the mount, mount local disk stage, and in this case, Here's my stage, which says mount local disks, some metadata about it, and then there's two tasks. There's erase hard disks for OS install and mount disks. So if we look at this task, erase hard disks for install, um, now I need to, so there's a description which runs a template, 
Okay, it sounds a little circular at first, and this always gets people uh, caught out at first, but it's circular like this on a reason, for a reason because it allows us to create composable content that allows us to take little blocks of use. I can reuse this erase disks at many different workflow stages. Like a decommission stage, I want to wipe the disks to recycle the machines. So mount disks.shell. So this is uh, very much a simple bash script, except that it's Golang templated. So we actually uh, dynamically fill this out from our in-memory file system and our in-memory structures uh, when it's served to the, to the client machine. We actually inject this into the template. So it allows you to take and create. I have no idea how I just dismissed that. I've never done that before. Um, but this allows us to take, and it doesn't have to be Bash. We write all of our example content in Bash because almost everybody can sort of understand it and into it, and it's easy for people to pick up and reuse. You could use whatever you want, custom binaries, Python, Perl, whatever you want on the machine to implement your workflow, your tasks. Uh, but this is an example of a simple task that actually makes sure our DRCP CLI binary is in place. We're going to set some uh, Rocket Skates UUID and Rocket Skate tokens. Rocket Skates was the internal code name that Victor picked, so now everything is RS. Um, and it, the token actually gives us authorization. It's dynamically generated for us by the endpoint and handed to us. We bring that into the, the configuration. We provide that token back that prevents, uh, presents our authorization to do this action. And then we actually just do, okay, let's get some disks, do some LS block stuff. Let's write some stuff. Oh, my gosh. Greg wrote this, and he didn't use SDisk, um, no, SGDisk. He's using FDisk, and so he's piping to FDisk. When... <laughs> I'm going I'm to tease Greg about this. So we have SGDisk on our, our uh, image. Uh, and then we do some part probe stuff. We do some file system stuff. We mount some file system stuff as Docker. Now, if we were sophisticated, we could actually create a parameter that says um, uh, set mount disks uh, file system location or something better name than that, but you get the idea. That could be a parameter that we attach to the machine, and it would be injected into this template so the actual uh, file system location would be uh, flexible based in, in injected into this template. So this was hacked out in, as clearly we can see, in a matter of minutes to support um, the crib uh, it process. Only one disk. And it only supports one disk, yes. It's a very basic a, a pattern that you can follow. But as you can see, there's a lot you can do in this, I think, that um, if you were a little bit more um, thrifty or um, interested in putting a little bit more time into a much more stronger reusable pattern for your environment, you could take, pick it up very easily. This was written, all of the crib stuff was written in about a day to support uh, mutable Kubernetes cluster deployments, uh, which is actually a strong testament to just the contents capabilities of uh, um, our ability to, to create complex cluster deployments. Uh, Kubernetes is not particularly, I don't think it's particularly hard to deploy, but I used to deploy OpenStack at you know tens of thousands of node scale size, and OpenStack is much, much more complex than Kubernetes. Pardon? How can you test those scripts? Just run it. Yeah, run it, run it, run it. We do have a very strong pattern of fail first, fail often, fail loudly. And our jobs logs is generally pretty good in providing all of this information back. So when you actually um, run a task, a job is associated and assigned to run that task. The task is run and everything is captured from that job and provided back in the log. This is also provided back out as web, web events. Uh, so uh, web, web events, so you can actually subscribe to the DRP CLI endpoint with any web, events, uh, web event client and filter on a given thing and get events emitted back. An example use case of that is emitting messages to Slack. Slack is just web events. And so you can actually integrate with Slack and, and put all your provisioning activities in, as web events into Slack, or you can have your external um, something consuming this. Uh, we do have the ability to create plugins to do other interesting things. So you might have your own log audit infrastructure uh, environment where you want to externally log to an external audit log pool or something. We support that capability as well. The, the so all of the templates, when they are configured 
uh, and that are not stock in a, a naked DRP endpoint are stored ultimately in the right layer of the file, layered file system model, which is on disk, but they also reside in memory. And then we have a consistency model that ensures consistency between the memory model and, and the writ, writ, write to disk model. So the benefit to that is if you've actually configured, you created all your content, and now you've figured out how you want to do your provisioning, and you have all of your content in a DRP endpoint that does all of this, you can literally shut the DRP endpoint down, copy that to another machine, power it on, or start the service up, and it's automatically configured. Now, you can also poke it with commands and API and the UI to configure it and do stuff for you. You can hand roll it and that sort of thing. Uh, I've done a bunch of automation of configuring it through shell scripting and, and Terraform, combination of Terraform and shell scripting, because Terraform is not an orchestration engine. Is anyone from HashiCore here? I really should have asked first. <laughs> I like HashiCore. They do really cool things, but they drive me crazy sometimes. Terraform is a perfect example of that. Um, so we've done, there's a lot of great questions. I really appreciate it. This is awesome. Very, very engaged crowd. Um, are there any more questions we want to go on? It's, it's 9.40 now. It's getting kind of late. Um, I, I think people are probably interested in going home. Um, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself here. I apologize I didn't get to a real demo but uh, we got a lot more questions than I really anticipated. Um, like I said, rebar.digital or shane at rack n, the letter n, uh, dot com if you want to shoot me an email and ask me questions. If you're interested in our um, product, if you're interested in the open source piece, uh, we typically recommend you come in through our open source community. Uh, we have a community channel on our Slack uh, service. We have a bunch of external integrations, so if you don't, you don't like Slack, you can come in at and talk to us through external services. But we have a community channel in Slack. Um, if you want to get started playing around, uh, we have a quick start document that will sort of uh, walk you through um, some basic provisioning uh, configuration. And that process just gives you a quick walkthrough on, on how to do and set up a, a DRP endpoint and play with it. And if you run into issues, you have questions, you're not understanding something, something's not working the way you expect, ping us on the community channel. We're excited to engage with the community. We learn a lot through our community channel. Um, it's one of the reasons I self-elected to be a community evangelist. Um, it, it's really a, a huge uh, positive asset to be able to feed back into our product to get sort of some free QA and some use cases from community members. And some of the community members do some really interesting things. We're like, wow, that's really cool. We got someone that's playing with uh, a 20 node Raspberry Pi cluster that they want to bootstrap with DRP with DRP on the ras one of the Raspberry Pis. And so I actually did a, a ARM based uh, compile of our digital rebar provision endpoint service so it'll run on uh, ARM based Raspberry Pis. Um, so I had a follow up question from our buddy Joseph here. Um, whomever brought up the fog question hit on what I meant. IoT, it's just I'm pushing AI to the IoTs and over, over time they decide where. They're going to port their information after they investigate an environmental phenomena. Nearest data center to their activity. Yes, Edge and IoT is very much about that. So, again, it sounds like you have some interesting use cases. Please reach out to me, Shane, at RackN, uh, or find our rackn.com slash support slash Slack if you want to sign up for our Slack and start some conversations with us. It sounds like some interesting use cases. We're very excited about Edge, uh, Fog, IoT stuff because I think that we, um, we have a very interesting and unique proposition for those workloads and use cases that most services just can't handle, uh, the scale and distributed sprawl nature of those environments. Ping me through your guys' board. I'd be happy to come back at some point. If there are more focused topics you'd like to talk on, uh, things like the Kubernetes, uh, immutable bootstrap stuff, immutable provisioning in general, if you want to get into more specifics about immutable provisioning, uh, more detailed information about our, Kuber, our Terraform provider. We do have a lot more advanced use cases and workflows I can show with Terraform. Terraform certainly has a positive uh, uh, opportunity for some shops in some environments. And uh, some days I love it and some days I hate it. Um, but in, in any other questions or ideas you have around that, I would love to talk to you guys. If any of you are interested in talking to us or coming into the, the community, please feel free to drop by. 
Look forward to interacting with you. Everybody, it's been fantastic. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.